Sedco, a town councilor, and also even a reporter. So, uh, and, and of course, the town manager. <laughs> Today, I actually saw on the Today Show it said that the uh, one of the worst jobs to have um, in America today is being a reporter. And broadcaster was right up there. So, uh, you know, God bless you. And um, it's a good thing not biased. <laughs> that's the fourth estate, right? Um, You're right. <laughs> So uh, um, with that, as well as the town manager, and uh, the purpose of today's meeting is to begin the budget review process um, that we received from the town manager at our last uh, town meeting. And um, the agenda has changed slightly since the last meeting, so uh, to clarify for the uh, viewing audience in particular, we'll first have uh, public safety, which is fire and police, and EMS as so part of that as well. Then it will be the planning department, and then MIS or IT. Um, we're expecting to run right up until about 6 o'clock. Um, I've already warned uh, several of the presenters, if you go over your time limit, we're deducting uh, something uh, from the budget, so uh, be careful. Um, no, I'm just kidding. Um, but with that, I'm going to turn it over to, um, uh, let me, let me uh, sorry, before I turn it over to Tom, because uh, mm -hmm. this is Chris's first time, and, but just for the public as well, this is a fairly open process on the way I've run it in the past. Um, the questions and answers, I hope, will flow as we carry on the conversation, so don't feel that you need to hold on to them until the end. Um, and don't expect, um, you don't have to ask me to be recognized, just go ahead and let's um, ask those questions. And there will be an opportunity for public comment at the end as well. So uh, with that, I'm now going to turn it over to Tom. Yeah, I'd like to suggest a, a couple of basic principles that would run throughout the whole budget review, uh, just to make sure we touch on revenues for each department, uh, expenditures, and we can talk about them. We reflect them in a couple of different ways, and then the capital projects. Um, you know, we've scheduled folks uh, with time in front of you, so let's make good use of that time. Um, I might suggest when it gets to the expenditures, you spend your time and focus on the narrative section in tab four, though the line item detail is there, and we're certainly pleased uh, to, to deal with that level of detail should you wish, but it, I think your time will be better spent kind of a bit higher, if you will, and tab four is probably where you ought to focus your attention. Yep. So if that pleases the committee, I would suggest uh, if you could flip to tab three, page three. Uh, we can make quick work of the fire revenues first, and then we can move right to the expenditures. So Tom, one of the, if we could have it as maybe as a um, going forward exercise page with each department as, um, before we get into the details of revenues, and then uh, can you provide an overview of the total picture? <coughs> We can um, certainly and start with that. If you yeah, like. I, I think that would be a really good start, and Great. then we can get into Please the details on, underneath it. Please do. Go ahead. Go ahead. So uh, the fire department revenues do show up on that tab, page three, and if folks are looking from home, as I am on my computer, it's page 30 of the PDF, um, because it's not sequentially numbered all throughout that document. So the fire uh, revenues are increased a total of $45,500, or 5.5% this year, and there's... Uh, four drivers to where that number comes from. The first is we are increasing EMS billing revenues by 52,500 or 7%. And this is the first increase we've proposed in EMS billing for a few years. Um, most of it is driven on call volume, so we're doing more volume, we're billing more dollars. Um, one of the reasons that we haven't billed it is our rescue revenue balance, our reserve account, um, we have been bringing that amount down over a period of years. So we were actually moving more into the general fund to help support the EMS budget than we were taking in for a few years. Now we've got to the point where our increases in revenue are starting to get to the point where we're able to fund more. So that 52000 um, was really intended to help move our staffing program forward, uh, although that's a topic for a little further in the discussion tonight. The second uh, item is inspection and permit fees. Those uh, I am projecting a $10,000 increase, which is a 44% uh, increase. And that is due to, uh, first and foremost, my very conservative budgeting. I, I, when we had the economic downturn, I was really careful about projecting more revenue than was coming in. So I, I budget this line conservatively f for a reason. I never want to be under. But our volume has certainly exceeded, and over the past several budget years, we have brought in more in, in fees than we have budgeted for. So I picked it up for that. But you will note when we get to the schedule of fees, we've also increased our minimum fees, and we've adjusted our fee schedule to m be more in line with um, the State Fire Marshal's Office. And I'll speak to that when we get to the fee schedule uh, in just a second. 
Socker Street rental income you'll see is up $6,000. That shows a big percentage increase because it's a low dollar amount, but uh, that's showing a 125% increase. That's because we have a new tenant. And although uh, we took that opportunity to, to get the price up to something that is still affordable and, and for folks that are working in public safety, we're in the process now of actually vetting some candidates, um, but we will be offering that um, house next to North Scarborough Station for somebody in the business at below market rates uh, and still be able to increase our revenues. And then the final piece, which is a, a negative piece, is the loss of the EMPG grant. Uh, through Maine Emergency Management, we have for a number of years now had a what they call an emergency management performance grant that reimburses 50% of eligible costs for our emergency management agency program. Um, we don't have time to go into exactly why all the details of what caused this, but this, I believe, is only going to be a one-year issue. There were some issues with the federal grant program at the state level. There was um, some overspending at the state that they had to make <coughs> an adjustment of this year. Our share of the adjustment is essentially a $23,000 hit in my revenue line that I think we're going to get back up to where we were previously next fiscal year. I've spent quite a bit of time with the state. So, Chief, can I ask a question yeah, along those lines? Um, were, was the decrease proportional across all the communities in the state, or was it weighted, or did we take a larger hit than others, or, you know, we see that obviously on the educational side of things, so I'm just curious to know where we're. What happened was the, the local communities, the, one, the, the, the pot of money is split between the state takes a percentage off the top, the counties get the bulk of the money in this program, and then the local communities get what's left. The local communities took the brunt of the, the cuts, uh, and a lot of it was because of excessive spending at the county level that was funded in lieu of the local. Thank you. Just a quick question, Chief. Certainly. Um, when you said the rescue service fees, are those, are those mostly paid by third parties, insurers and stuff, um, versus citizens that's out of their pocket? So I'm just trying to figure out how much our constituents are impacted out of pocket versus this is just a reimbursable expense through insurers and third parties and other types of things. Yep. The vast majority is funded by the insurance companies. Yep. I don't have the exact percentages yep. in front of that's me. That's what I would have thought. Yeah. Okay. And, and, and the, philosoph the philosophical reason for that, and, and we've had this and, and it's probably good for the public, your tax dollars support the service and having that availability there, but we try to make sure that we also pair that with those that use the service. So where most folks have health insurance and health insurance certainly covers ambulance services, we try to recoup as much revenue as we can through that process to help offset the, the tax mm -hmm. payer so that there's two parts that fund our operation. Is it roughly break even or is it not even close to break even? What it you does. Get in? We're probably at close to 50% now of the EMS budget. Okay, thank you. You're welcome. So that kind of that's the 10,000 foot view on revenues. Is there any other questions? So the next uh, section, I guess, is the schedule of fees, and ours are on page nine or page 43 of the PDF. <laughs> if you're that's in the back of tab three. It's, uh, It's actually the, the uh, it's an ordinance, and it's set up in, in that form. Yep. Yep. And there's really only two um, primary areas where we've made a change. The first is in our construction permit and inspection fees. Uh, our previous minimum was $25. We've increased that to $35, but we used to build. Um, now we're going to build by the number of devices, so if you put 25 detectors in, it's so much a device, which brings us in line with what the state fire marshal's office does at the state level. Small projects will pay less, larger projects will pay more. It seems to be a little more equitable uh, way to do it, and it will increase overall re permit revenues slightly, uh, as well as the fact that we've got an increase in, in uh, overall permits being issued because of construction. The second uh, change in the fee schedule is the EMS billing rates, and you'll note that those are actually going down slightly. Our EMS um, bundled rates are tied to the federal Medicare fee schedule, and when they made that adjustment in January, those rates actually went down 0.4%, so there's a very slight decrease, but in keeping with our policy, that's how we ended up uh, adjusting those this year. Any questions of the fee schedule? 
Yeah, just a quick question. You, you reduced or removed the sprinkler fee for commercial permitting, but I noticed you put in a per head fee. So uh, do you expect those to offset, or is that um, completely removed from the fee structure? No, there's a, it used to be a single $100 fee, regardless of how big the project was. So now there's a minimum $35 permit fee if you're only putting a handful of heads <coughs> in. Gotcha. But if it's a larger project, so county per okay. head gets you where you need to be. Yeah. And that kind of balances out so the larger projects are paying a larger fee. We're spending more time there inspecting and incurring more costs and reviewing those plans. Okay. And, and does this mirror, does this get you closer to the cost? your fees that you're getting for these inspections and other things, yes. or again, <coughs> so this is pretty much a break-even, you think? Uh, absolutely, yeah. That's, okay. that's how we've priced these, so that we're Great. covering yep. as Good. best okay. we can the cost of providing those services. Great. So, Tom, if you can, mm -hmm. from a historical perspective, um, how successful <coughs> are we realizing the revenue projections that we have? Are we 100% on, 98%? Do we go over? I'm sure they're not uh, like community services where revenues always exceed what we budget, but. <laughs> well, we can do some detailed analysis. I think it probably um, is a bit of both, depending on uh, so economy, the economy matters, of course. But I'd like to say on par, we're, we're pretty darn accurate pretty darn uh, okay. on our revenues. That's um, good enough for me. I know from our department, we have been, we always budget on the conservative side, so yep. we, we always meet our numbers. Not necessarily in every line, but right. collectively yep, at, the absolutely. Yep. <laughs> at the end of the day. At the end of the day. So our operational budget is on page 57 of that tab, tab four. or page 106 of the big PDF, if you're looking at that. And once again, from the 10,000-foot view, the department-wide increase is a total of $395,300, or 9.3%. And essentially, all of that increase is due to wages and benefits that I'll explain in just a second. There is about a $27,000 increase in the services and charges line, uh, and those are driven by increases in station and apparatus maintenance lines, um, primarily due to the cost of parts for apparatus and some of the outlied, out, <coughs> excuse me, outside service that we um, farm out that public works either doesn't have the time or the expertise for some of the, the detailed work that we have to ship out. Those costs continue to, to be a little higher than we had budgeted. There is a $40,000 decrease in the surplus in the supplies line, uh, and that line encompasses all the reduced vehicle fuel costs that we're anticipating due to some aggressive contracting, uh, as well as the contract for propane for heating our facilities in our stations. And finally, there's some significant electricity savings at the public safety building because of the additional capacity from the tri-generation project here oh, in the town hall oh. that is now kicked in and uh, that, as you may recall, was sized to help um, power the new public safety building, so we're allocating those excess savings to that account now, and so that shows a significant decrease. Yeah, CMP allows us to assign up to 10 <coughs> beneficiary uh, meters with it under the same name, and I don't think we get past two or three before we exhaust the excess electricity. First and foremost, we consume it here, and there's most of the time of year uh, we'll be producing more electricity than we can use. So, as Mike says, they're, I think, the first beneficiary account, uh, and we'll see the greatest part of that savings. Mm -hmm. So, so the mechanics are you sell back into the grid, and then CMP or whoever issues a credit that gets allocated. Is that? Uh, it's it's technically under their net metering program. I don't profess to understand exactly how it works, but uh, yes, it, it goes back on the grid, so to speak, um, to, to be able to get to the money go back. through their meter. Yeah, cool. Great. So, quick question, Tom, for the public safety building. How is the maintenance <coughs> and the facilities done because it's a split building? Is it all done on fire or is it split 50-50 between police and fire or is it all a different... Maintenance for this facility? Is and and the, and the electrical accounts and things like that. I mean, are we going to see a similar reduction on the police side of things as well or is it all going to be captured here on the, on the fire no, side? No, the way we've done it is we split certain utilities up. So, I take the, all the power for the entire facility okay. and Robbie takes all the natural gas that heats the facility. Gotcha. And that's, okay. Rather, rather than trying to, you know, that, that. that's fine. I just want to. I'm just trying to figure out if, if everything's captured here, or if we we get to look at that in another another category as well. But if it's all here, then that's that's good. For us. That's all I need. Sure. So to better understand the the increase in the operational budget, we do have to talk about staffing, and I know that, that uh, 
the intent is to talk about new proposals in, in a different meeting, so I, I won't get into too much detail. But to understand the increase in the current year's operational budget, we have to go back and look at last year's mm -hmm. um, process because in FY16, we had brought forward our staffing plan for four full-time yeah. firefighters and some per diem hours. And the council found a compromise where instead of hiring four, you hired two new full-timers, but we postponed them for nine months and they didn't start until actually last week. So the delayed implementation cost of picking up those nine months in this current proposal for FY17, for those two people, amount to 119, 129. That's the additional portion? Only? That's the three quarters of the year that wasn't carried forward yeah. in this yeah. year. Yeah. In addition to those two full-timers, you folks also authorized another 84 hours of per diem hours per week, which was the night shift at North Scarborough Station so that we had somebody there 24 hours a day. But that was delayed until essentially June 30th, the last day of this current <laughs> fiscal year. So I've had to pick up all of those hours in the new fiscal year. And that total cost was uh, 92612 So between those two decisions that were made last year, and we appreciate the you know, compromised position, but that added, that's, that represents 211741 yeah. out of that $395,000 increase. Also, in the new fiscal year staffing proposal that we're going to talk about in a different meeting, there were three components that made up my original request. One was for new full-time positions. We knew that our staffing plan calls for four a year. We knew that because we were going to have to pick up the cost of the two that were delayed in the current fiscal year, that coming in and asking for four just was not going to happen. So I only asked for two full-timers this year in the FY17 plan. And there is a, a there was a mistake in the slides <coughs> during the presentation the other night um, where Tom had picked up four. It, it really is only two that we had requested. Um, So it was three components of the request in FY17. Two full-time positions, full year. The second piece is meeting our contractual obligation for the officer differential pay that we had negotiated two years ago that is triggered when we hire the next two people. That's when that contract language kicks in. And then the third piece to our request this year was 63 additional hours of per diem coverage, which gets rid of our remaining nine-hour shifts so that we are better able to cover the commute times before and after work when our call numbers are really struggling. It's that time between 6 o'clock in the morning and, and 8 when folks are getting ready to go to work and that supper time commute when <coughs> folks haven't got back from home and the per diem leaves at 5 o'clock. So, sorry if I could. Um, Certainly. I, I, I know you, you addressed that in the description. I'm in Exhibit 2C now um, mm -hmm. of Tab 9. I believe you did address the additional um, EMS people and the staffing for that to reduce the overtime hours. Have we seen, and I noticed you in there you said you've also reduced overtime hours, so that was a positive result. How much of this increase is additional overtime hours in your staffing? Is it a, you, you know what I'm saying? So in this, in your, in your <coughs> general budget, you've got, you broke down the two new positions, the 84 hours of the new per diem, that took out 211,741. Then we've got um, officer, adjust pay adjustments. Is there still an overtime, a large bulk of overtime in the department that's showing up on this wages and benefits level? In the base operational budget? In the base operational There are budget. overtime dollars in there, yes. Right. So, but they have been reduced based on the two new positions, the two EMS positions, right? No. <laughs> <laughs> because I, I'm, I'm asking that because you, you in, in the ex, in Exhibit C you said, um, authorize, uh, in addition to the EMS staffing, the council authorizes a full-time pool firefighter EMT on each side. That was designed to reduce overtime. And, and that pool position is not what we're proposing. That is one that we instituted three years ago now? Yes. That position is, was specifically to eliminate overtime. So the yep. first overtime opportunity in any given shift, Goes we to move that person, that person right. into right. that slot and don't backfill that position. Right. So then the question I have is, do you still have a large bulk of overtime requirements in addition to that person? There are overtime. There's, there's always more than one person off. Yep. But yeah, it, yeah. that position served its purpose yep. and has significantly. It, it is covering an overtime shift 
almost 50% of the time. Okay. So maybe if I rephrase it this way, is there still a need in the budget somewhere to accommodate that overtime positions that's still in the operational budget? Would an additional EMS person help reduce more overtime hours, or are we pretty much at a, I guess, relatively normal overtime hour status now? I, I think we're at the, now I better understand your okay. question. Yes, sir. <laughs> I think in the future we will be proposing another pool type position. I don't think we're quite there yet. Okay. It takes a period of time before it makes sense to, to do that. Um, right now we're, we're trying to fill needed slots, but at some point we will probably take a look at, at offering something like that again, and that would be the assignment to try to use that second pool person. Okay. I'm not sure if you have the question, but we did see, and we can document the savings in overtime in that first year that we instituted this pool position. We don't see it now because it's in the budget and there's not great changes year to year, but um, it, it served the intended purpose when it was first instituted and we've you know, stayed at that lower level since. Yeah. It's a significant number if you yeah. look at the number of shifts they're filling every... I, I'm just trying to help justify yeah. if we need a, if, if another position is required, let's look at the overtime amount and what savings were there and that kind of stuff to help fund it. So if we don't need that, then we don't need it right now, that's fine. Um, is there a way on the calls for service, and you may get to this at some point, is there a way to break out the fire versus EMS? Sure. Because I think that would be, it would be call. interesting for me um, to see, you know, and then look at staffing along. Because I know you're, it looks like the calls are obviously going up at a pretty steady rate. Um, I, obviously not right now, I but they're actually at some point. They're in there. the first page yeah. of 2C. Right, 2C. Well, I'm look, I see total calls for service. Oh, you want to break down between? Yeah, that's what I was wondering. How much of that, how much of the increase is driven by EMS versus fire calls? The total calls for, it's back on the main budget page, so. Okay. Um, Eighteen thirty-two is the calls for fire service, and get back to the EMS page. Yeah, it's it's well over fifty percent our EMS, and those numbers are on the base budget. But okay, I didn't catch those. Eighteen thirty-two or four? Eighteen thirty-two or EMS? Or oh, five. Okay, and then the remainder is EMS, uh, EMS obviously. So, are you seeing a, a disproportionately, or I should say disproportional? Are you seeing one group go up more than the other? Yeah, EMS calls continue to okay. become a larger part of what we do. Absolutely. Okay. So these these two additional full time firefighters uh, are they also going to be EMT trained as well to help alleviate some Absolutely. of those? Absolutely. All of okay. our full time folks are cross trained, so they can do both. Okay. Just a quick question. I'm, I'm trying to. One of my focuses this year is going to kind of be looking at the base sort of compensation structures we have in place. So mm -hmm. doing the math, you, you did itemize the things you you talked about was 211. Then there was the pay differential you talked about. Did you give a number of what that was? What that pay differential was? Yes, that's on the. If you look at the page, <coughs> Exhibit 2C page 286 in the PDF, there is a chart in the top third of that page that talks about the three different things and it, it breaks out in detail where those costs come from. So what we're essentially doing with that pay differential is we, we currently have four duty officers that are at the rank of lieutenant. What we agreed to contractually was we would make those captain's positions and we would create four new lieutenants positions due to the number of folks that we've got now. So there are two components to um, that reclassification. One is to change the lieutenant's pay to the captain's pay, and one is to um, change a private's pay to a lieutenant's pay. And the total cost for all that, including the benefits, is 75304 How much? 75304 okay. So, so then, so if I take that off, so if, so taking your base wage and benefit line is a 10.7 percent increase. Then you factor out um, the the 211. We're down over a 5 percent increase, 5.6. So underneath everything, what is sort of driving is the union contracts? I mean, is it sort of a what's what's sort of the range of things that are built into the contract that you may not have control over for wages now, but might be able to later? If you 
let me answer it a different way. Yeah. If you back out the cost that I had to incur based on the new staffing that was instituted this year, the, okay. the full-time yeah. cost of those, yeah. and you back out the one thing I didn't finish, the, the three components of my FY17 plan, Tom included one component of that in the FY17 budget before you. So the 61,081 per diem hours are part of this plan. If you exclude that new staffing and the cost of the staffing that I had to pick up from the current year, mm -hmm. my increase is only 2.4, okay, it's in my summary, 2.4% uh, okay. is where my expenses are. Okay. And that includes a cost of living for our contractual obligations yeah. as well as our non union folks. That's, that's very helpful. Thank and you. And 2% for fire is the contractual obligation. Is that right? <coughs> yes. That was the union contractor. Yes. Yeah. Okay. Thank you. That, thank you. That's that, right. I think that's thank where you, you. Yes, that would be at the end of the day. Yes. Sir. Thank you. I had it in my last paragraph. Sorry. <laughs> Sorry. So, and just one more clarification for me, if you could, Chief. How many uh, officers are in the fire department? Chiefs, captains, lieutenants, total, with this new alignment, how many total officers are you going to have? Including the call folks or just the full time staff? Because uh, I've got some call, <coughs> we've got six companies, so I've got some call officers. There's, there's three full time chiefs. Yep. And then we've got four full-time duty officers. They're the folks that are here 24 hours a day and run the on-duty staff, mm -hmm. essentially the full-time staff and the per diems that are working during their limited hours. Mm -hmm. And then each call company has a call, a, a, some call officers. There's a captain and some lieutenants in each one of the neighborhood call companies. Could, so um, those part-time call people or the per diem call people, are they covered by this? this um, uh, realignment, if you will, no, officers. That's so strictly for the full-time staff. Okay. So on full-time, then, can you give me a run? You said you get three chiefs, four duty officers. I assume those are full-time as well. That's correct. Uh, and then on the company side, do you have full-time? You have one co one company. I think is full-time staffed. Is that right? Or not? None of no, them. No. None. None of them. Okay. Okay. So a total of seven full-time officers right now in the fire department. Correct. Okay. Thank you. And that will change with this new plan. To add four new lieutenants. We're going to add four. Okay. To supervise 28. Yeah. I want to make sure I get the head count right. Sure. <laughs> Thank you. So you're achieving just sir, you're achieving the reclassification of those um, those employees with the existing budget that you already have because you got them last year. Because there's no new request yet. So we, you're already reclassifying those positions. Right we have not. Time. We we don't make that change in the officer reclassification until we hire the next two full-time people. The next people. two have to be hired. Okay. That's, that's right. the trigger. Yeah, the I remember you said at the beginning of that. Sorry. Yep. Thank no you. No problem. Yep. But this budget, my proposal, does include one of the three elements, which is additional per diem hours right. to cover that commute time, and that's a price tag of $61,081. And that, that really was why I brought this whole subject up. That, yep. that yep. is what explains the rest of the increase that gets me to 9.3%. Right. Yep. Yep. So if you back all that out, my real increase is 2.4%. Yeah. <coughs> one, one last quick question on that. When you, when you talked about, <coughs> you know, I just said in the write-up for the school budget, they talked about how Scout, you know, the public works is doing a lot of work on the buses. That's saving a ton. Of, is it, and I'm sure you've already explored it, but is it worth training some of the, the public works guys to do some of that work that you're, I mean, I think you said earlier that outsourcing that, that maintenance work is becoming harder and more expensive. Is there any opportunities for shared services there, or have you just maximized everything that's there? No, we, we do 90% or more yeah. work at Public Works, and they do a great job. Yeah. It's yeah. just that the, the, some of the specialized, if we have to send it to Cummins Diesel, yeah. there are some expensive repairs that we really have to send yeah. to the manufacturer's reps, mm -hmm. and those are the costs that are being driven. The day-to-day -day stuff, Public Works does an outstanding job at a very yeah. economical price. Thank you. <coughs> That's all engine and pumps, and the fire side, it, you know, having the maintenance of the pumps and all of those systems is a fairly unique and important and can be very expensive. Yeah. Um, but we've sent our folks to get that training right. and they do it all in-house and do a great and, job at it. And that's it. exactly why we're attracted to City of Westbrook and the town of Old Orchard Beach, uh, who has a need for those services and we'd like to be able to offer that to them and cover our costs in doing so. Yeah. So that pretty well takes care of my overview of the operational budget. Do you have any other questions about that before we get into CIT? Um, I'm lucky I've been around long enough that I 
it's almost like uh, doing it in my sleep, but I think that, um, well, I mean, when, you, when you're looking at the circumstances and the overall budget and the bigger picture, um, you know, let's be clear, I think that the uh, wage and benefits increases are consistent with current practices, policies, and contracts. Nothing deviates from that. I think the bigger questions that I have is really about long-term planning, uh, which in a way is starting to become short-term <laughs> that we need to look at. So I'll have more questions around that long-term piece or that planning piece and particularly the HR allocation requests and, and what we're looking at over time because we're getting further and further behind. So I'll, I'll wait for my questions really around that. <coughs> so on capital, we break it up into yeah. projects and equipment. If we could start with equipment, tab six, there are four items. And that's on page 143 of the PDF for anybody watching from home. There are four items. The first is the rescue rechassis. Uh, this item is proposed to be funded from EMS billing revenues. That's another reason why we, we try to keep that revenue account funded at a level enough to be able to take these so we don't have to borrow money when we need to replace an ambulance. And this is a change from our previous process. Um, five years ago, we were buying a new ambulance every year, and the idea was we had three of them. We staffed two full time, and the third one is used by the call company or fills in when the other ones are being out. And by doing that on a three-year rotation, we were trading them in. We were getting 50% back from the vendor that we were doing business with. At the end of that time, it kept us within the manufacturer's warranty, so we were paying essentially nothing in maintenance costs. I did a, an analysis five years ago, and, and we determined that by increasing our maintenance budget a little bit, we could keep those ambulances a little bit longer, and we've gone to this rechassis plan, and this is the first time we're doing it. So now, instead of replacing the new truck every three years completely, we're rechassising after five years, and we're using the old body for two cycles. So this year, our proposal mm -hmm. is to rechassis our oldest ambulance, um, the, and then we'll do that for the next two years and, and cycle those out. <coughs> and over the course of that 10-year uh, projection that I made five years ago, we saved about $180,000. So I, I think it, it's going to work out well. The second item is an ATV replacement. This is a unit that we have shared with community services for some time. Uh, it's at the Pine Point Station. They use it for trash pickup and beach cleaning in the morning, and then we use it as necessary for calls on the beach or anything off uh, off road. We really don't have any vehicles that can get off road now. So that's used a lot. Um, actually, one of the counselors, after we had a, a cardiac arrest out on the sandbar, said, make sure that you get this in the budget this year. So that's one of the reasons that it's that it's in here. Uh, that current you, counselors or former counselors? Uh, that was a former yeah. counselor. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> yes. But I followed directions. Yeah. <laughs> it, I mean, is there something wrong with the current That existing yeah. unit is at the end of its life. Yes. It's, and, it's, and it's, it's well used. Is this the full cost, or is it split between community services? The full cost. They bought the last one, and it's just my turn to pony up and buy this one, and we're still going to share it. The third item is rescue power stretchers. Um, a number of years ago, we bought these electric uh, stretchers so that it, would, it was the newest thing out there to help with back injuries, which is huge in EMS. Those are at the end of their useful life, and instead of just replacing them with the existing units, Tony has researched, and there's a new product out there that also has a component in the ambulance body itself, because even our old stretches, they had a power lift, but you still manually had to hold the end of it as you're putting it in, so there was still an opportunity for dropping patients and or back injuries. Now the system has actually got a component that fits into the ambulance, the rear of the ambulance, and it, it actually does all the lifting, so there's no way to, to lose a patient or get any kind of a back injury, and, and that's uh, what that item is for. And then the fourth item is uh, part of the replacement plan is to replace one of our staff vehicles. This Deputy Deering's truck is up this year. Those were originally in the uh, apparatus replacement plan on a 10-year plan, and we've been able to, to milk this out to 12 years. Those, those units have really proven themselves as um, the right tool for the right job, and we've been able to get 12 years out of them without any trouble. But that must assume, do they need, I mean, that's an, it's a big rig, right? Suburban <coughs> or a... It's a Tahoe. A Tahoe. Do they need that? I mean, that's a kind of upper-end vehicle. Can they, they do, do what they need they to do without a Tahoe? The equipment that they carry that we've, we've purchased, um, command 
centers for the back, so all their gear pulls out. They've got radios and everything built in. We've made quite an investment in setting those up that is all exchangeable to the next size vehicle. We tried to, to downsize and go to something different. We'd essentially wasted all that. If, if I could just make a suggestion, not kind of off topic a little bit, um, it might be nice uh, to do something similar with the fire vehicles and the police vehicles, what they do at Public Works, where you put the sticker on there that says the year that they came in, mm -hmm. the vehicle number and the year they came in. I don't, I don't recall seeing them on any of the, of the and I, because I know people will look, they're so well maintained. I've had people look and say, they got brand new trucks every year. I'm sure that's not the case, 100% sure. But something that you could point to again and just say, sure. actually, that's, that's an 02. <laughs> So, this is a point. suggestion. Absolutely. Here's a quick question. I'm kind of looking at capital expenditures and what that does. So, the F means that the ATV we're going to finance, right? No, actually, I'm glad you brought that up. I was going to use this. Um, this is uh, one of the projects that I propose using um, undesignated fund balance toward. Mm -hmm. uh, you might recall in that fund balance okay. discussion, okay. Yeah. the dollar amount, which is above 10%, is about 540000 yeah. or so. Yeah. Okay. So, gone through the capital requests and are assigning various projects, uh, but that's my proposed use, and I know Councillor Bayline may have some questions, comments, concerns regarding that proposal, so I'm glad you brought it up. You'll see that F kind of carry throughout. Okay. okay. Um, so it's not tax dollars raised, it's, it's uh, existing Fundamental. funds on hand. But I was just wondering, I guess, the, the, I'm sorry, Sean, yeah. the second part of that question is I just know community services usually, that's a revenue center and usually has they have some funds too that they have mm -hmm. available. So just wondering whether, whether out of the, you know, whose pocket it should really come out of. That's all. From the, no, we we, we can consider how a different way to finance that one item, the yeah, ATV. Yeah. Sure. Yeah. Um, I just want to clarify. So I don't have any questions about the request. I request. I have more questions and comments about how it's funded. Just make, whether it's whether it's reserves right. or financing or, um, you know, whatever it might be. So it's not about the request. Mm -hmm. As a, general, as a general comment, throughout the whole CIP, we're, we've been more mindful than ever, I think, with the sensitivity of financing things and how, you know, how we're paying for them. So you'll see, whenever possible, we're, we're looking at reserves, we're looking at other existing funds and, and appropriation in many cases, as opposed to long-term or even short-term finance. So, so that was it on capital equipment. There is one capital project item, which is on page three of that tab. We'll tab eight. Excuse me, seven. Seven, yeah. Or page 164 of the big book. <coughs> and that is for another municipal holding tank. This has been an ongoing project of um, cisterns that we put in the areas where we don't have public water. Um, in most cases, the developers fund these when we have new projects going in, but there are a few areas in town where we don't expect the anticipated development that would help fund those, and we periodically um, go in and, and add one in strategic areas where we need one, and there isn't one now. And placement of these will help us in our uh, ISO rating. And it so does. We don't necessarily see the benefit, but homeowners who are paying homeowners insurance in that area um, will often see a benefit um, having one of these facilities located, and it helps just generally with our response time and demonstration of our ability to, for fire suppression. One of the other changes that Deputy Daring spearheaded this year was working closer with Public Works. In the past, we've contracted all of this work out, and the vendor that provides the, the tanks now does most of the labor and setup and plumbing. So really, uh, the only thing left to do is the excavation. So Glenn spent some time with, with Mike and his staff down there, and we're going to partner with them, and they're going to do most of the other work. So that's going to save installation costs uh, rather than bid some of that work out like we have done in the past. Great. What's the life expectancy on these things? 20 years? 30 years? First one, the first one went in in 1987. And still going strong. Well, we're replacing well, that we're one. Okay. Yeah. <laughs> That's the yeah. first one. Yeah. Because it was fiberglass. Okay. Everything else is concrete. Okay. So uh, we've every once in a while we'll come up with a problem, one's leaking and stuff, and we hire somebody to come in and fix it. But I have 70 of them in place, yeah. Yeah. and I only have one problem child right now. Okay. <laughs> okay. And the, the one we're replacing, there's only 10,000 gallons fiberglass. We'd like to get it out and bring it up to 14,000 gallons. So concrete. With concrete, okay. yes. That was all I had in terms of uh, the high-level review. I certainly appreciate the opportunity to, to present. I look forward to another opportunity to talk about staffing again if that opportunity arrives. Um, 
and we already talked about the fact that we're at a 2.4 in percent increase if we mm -hmm. all things were equal. Things considered. And I know how much Robbie wants to get up here, so I don't want to delay. Him. <laughs> <laughs> you guys will have to debate who pays for the extra 10 minutes that you went over. <laughs> <laughs> well, we know somebody's picking up the ATV, so. <laughs> 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 Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. Thanks, you guys, for all you do. <laughs> nice to know you guys are just a call away. I've seen you. My neighbor has had you in his yard a couple times. You guys do a great job. <coughs> so allow us just a change of the guard. Pardon the... Thank you. I'm going low tech. <laughs> <laughs> low tech old school. <laughs> maybe maybe we'll keep up with you then. <laughs> well, first of all, thank you. Well uh, Thank you very much for the opportunity to be here and go over the budget. Um, I think you both. I think you all know uh, Deputy Chief Grover yes. and Deputy Chief St. Pierre. Thanks for coming. Um, I wasn't here for the beginning. I apologize for that I was down in Methuen, uh, but I bring back good news, which I'll share with you in a minute. So, um, but uh, my understanding is we're starting with revenues. Yes. And if you have any prepared comments, uh, I think Chief Thurlow started this kind of started and we end up pulling them off the script uh, ever please, but um, just what would you have any what say at the top? Well, at, at the top, I guess I would say that um, I appreciate that my understanding that we're going to have a chance to talk about staffing at a later date, and, I'm, uh, and I won't, uh, I will talk a little bit about that today, but that's really um, where I need to be. We, we have uh, asked for people um, for many years, and and I get it that the economy has been what it what it is, and the budgets have been what they have been, and um, we've been unable to uh, to do that. But uh, I have to tell you at this point that we are really, really struggling to keep our head above water, and um, it doesn't show uh, probably as much as it could because we're still getting the job done in terms of answering calls and being at emergencies and things like that. But what we're lacking is the proactive um, business that we can do because we are tied up with call to call to call um, and reports and the call <coughs> types that we're handling now are so much more involved and so much uh, more, you know, consume so much more time. Um, I think you saw some of the graphs there where our calls for service have increased over the last 10 years by 62 percent and we've grown 16 percent in officers and we're just not keeping pace and, um, and I see it every day and I hear it every day because people call me about traffic issues and neighborhood issues and things that we just can't um, and, and it's, it's hard to keep saying I don't have the people to do it but that is the reality of it. I, I just, uh, there are times when our people are just going nonstop from calls to reports to calls to reports and um, they just there's no time left to go out there and run traffic or do the things that we know need to be done and we just can't get that and it's it, it feels like giving excuses but it's it is what it is and so I guess as an opening remark <laughs> I can say that uh, as I mentioned I do have some good news Tom's not even aware of this but um, for those of you that may uh, be newer, um, we um, have an officer assigned to the HIDA task force, which is high intensity drug trafficking area uh, task force we have for many years, and the town actually uh, acts as its fiduciary. When we first got started in that business, we were finding uh, our officer was coming saying, my phone's being shut off, I gotta hide my car because they're repoing it because the bills weren't getting paid. And uh, we ended up meeting with, with DEA years ago and, and ended up taking over as fiduciary. So that brings money into to the town of Scarborough to handle their, their finances. So um, the good news is is that we, uh, we get 4% of, uh, of what they spend 
and we were projecting that that was going to be $120,000 this year. And because of some changes uh, that were made by policy so that uh, some of the spending that was able to be shelved, not shelved, but it, it, they, they had five years to spend money. The policies changed. They don't have five years to spend money anymore. So some of it's been accelerated. They've had to spend money uh, earlier. And so and there's a lot of other things that go along with it. But bottom line is we're, we're uh, conservatively looking at $150,000 there. Uh, maybe as much as 175 or so, but the director tells me the the finance director tells me that 150 is a is a good safe conservative number. So, is that sorry? Is that a one-time deal, chief, or is that something that's going to be recurrent moving forward? Are they just accelerating that to get to the end of this program and they start the next one and it evens out? They're hoping. They're hoping because of the heroin epidemic and so forth, and and the. Uh, uh, the national spotlight on that and so forth. ONDCP is is uh, coming out with more money and they've been shuffling more money off. So we're hoping that that keeps going. There's no guarantees, obviously, uh, especially with the federal, federal government, but uh, it looks like that will continue. Okay. Great news. So looking at the rest of the revenue picture, um, we actually have a, a good year here revenue-wise. We'll, we'll be going up slightly with the uh, PSAP billing for uh, Buxton, and that's because of uh, uh, their uh, census. We changed uh, the census number, which we were a little late doing that, but uh, we're catching up and have gone up a little bit on that. Um, the uh, salary reimbursement, we uh, Tom was uh, kind enough to allow us to, when the... When the uh, Legislature put the new comprehensive bill for the drug uh, treatment and and, um, and enforcement. There were openings for 10 new MDEA agents, and we took advantage of that. and And uh, Tom allowed us to assign one of our officers to to that unit. In return, we get uh, full full uh, reimbursement of our senior officer. We hired a, a junior officer to uh, fill that back, fill that spot, but we get uh, the salary and benefits from the senior officer. So there's a 89. That's what that $89,000 is. Uh, will be our reimbursement for that position. We also, uh, you're aware, we entered into an agreement with Cape Elizabeth to do their harbor master. So that's $5,500 increase there. We had a built-in uh, increase in the Old Orchard contract for doing dispatching and so forth. So there's 94, a little over 9,400 there. Um, the one place we did lose was the COP fast grant that uh, was done, so that $40,000 uh, came off. Um, that was not unexpected, uh, the way that grant works. It reduces over time and we have timed out. Yeah. And then um, we also have uh, the uh, grant revenues, which uh, we have not previously budgeted because we don't always know that we're going to have them, but those have been really consistent over the past few years, so we did put some uh, money in there that that we uh, pretty assured of this year. So. so, Chief, can you tell me which one of these line items, the, the, um, that new um, uh, grant money that you just talked about, the 120000 where is that going to show up on here? The bottom. On the it's at the bottom. Revenue. Federal Hydro Federal Revenues. Hydro Revenues. Yeah, yeah, gotcha. Okay, thank you. Thank you. Thank you. The, the beauty of that is the contract is the percentage, four percent of the total expenditures in this, this organization. So, though undoubtedly our workload will go up, we'll be processing some more payments, presumably. Um, I don't believe our costs will be going up. Um, it's not certainly dollar for dollar. So this is truly new revenue to us. And are those those officers are obviously they're they're based out of here. I would assume. Do they also help with local, or they just happen to be based here and they're still working on NDEA and other things as well, or do we? When they're not working on that stuff, we can still utilize them for capacity for other things, or are they full-time assigned to the other organization? Which one, the HIDER or the MDEA? Well, both. Actually. Both, okay. Yeah. yeah. Um, well, the way, it, the way it really works, we have a special enforcement unit which deals with uh, really problems of the day, and sometimes those are, are local uh, drug issues, and sometimes those are traffic issues or other things. Um, and so what happens is, and, and also they assist the uh, detective bureau with, you know, criminal investigations. So what happens is, is that uh, our hider officer, and the the hider officer is in a task force which involves state, local, and federal folks. So they're all combined, and they're really their focus is more on the heroin, 
Um, originally, it started with the cocaine. Um, you know, the corridor coming up through Lawrence Lowell, Mass, and and up through. Uh, so that's how Southern Maine originally got designated as a hider area. And so they deal basically with federal cases. So there's a, there's a level that they, they're not going to deal with the minor, <coughs> minor, uh, minor <laughs> offenses. But what happens is, is that uh, MDEA does do some of the other lower level things. Um, they're, they're dealing with uh, a lot of meth and, and those types of things. And they're working with our special enforcement folks. So what's happening is everybody's gearing off each other. Even though they're off, uh, our MDEA uh, officer works out of Portland, and he may be up in Naples or something. Uh, but as they develop information, they it's a small community, really, of these folks. Mm -hmm. And so even though they may be doing drug investigations in Naples, they hear about things that happen locally here with burglaries or thefts or robberies and those types of things. And so all that information is shared, and that's the model that we tried to get to, so that whatever the situation was, if it was something more local, they're going to pass information to us that our special enforcement folks can do. If it's something that's a, a more high-level federal-type case, then it's going to be off towards HIDA, and if it's, uh, if it's something statewide that's going it's to go through the state court, then it's directed towards MDEA. So we can take advantage of the best of all of those resources. So it's really, sorry, it's really like a shared resource then? It is. Okay. Yeah, Thank you. absolutely. So um, kind of a question that tails onto that, a little bit, maybe a higher picture of it, uh, at least I think. So there's a, it's about a 25% increase over last year. Um, definitely over what we're budgeting, approximately. Have the expenses related to HIDA locally gone up proportionally as that additional 25%? So, so right now, you, you've been at about 120,000 for the last couple of years. You're asking mm -hmm. for 120,000. We may be getting 150. So uh, the, the reason why I'm asking, I'll, I'll get to the point. The reason why I'm asking is that it seems to me personally, it seems to me that the benefit of receiving the increased funding is to maybe look at um, supporting Operation Hope, which is a direct correlation to the work that you do, um, because you are providing that work as well, um, to ease some of the, uh, rather than just simply putting it into the budget to fund what we're already doing, mm -hmm. to expand our services around that particular issue, and why not use the revenue that's being generated, which is really nothing more than expenses, a portion of expenses. So, you know. Do you need to keep it into the budget to fund the existing HIDA programs that you're, that you're providing the officers, or could it be used for um, additional services, such as funding Operation Hope a little bit? Well, there's, there's two or three questions there. Yep. No, uh, uh, okay, so... Um, I'm a town counselor. I'm glad you followed it. <laughs> I didn't. I had to write it down. <laughs> what was it again? Yeah. Uh, so... What I would say to you is when you asked about expenses going up, no, expenses have not gone up because this, as the manager was saying, this is really 4% uh, of anything that they're spending uh, right. New England-wide. So when they spend money, uh, Ruth's office processes those invoices and so forth, and for that, we get 4% of that. It has nothing to do with law enforcement. has nothing to do with activity. all that. Yeah. Yeah. Administrative, really financial yeah. functions. Yeah. <laughs> reason, sorry, the reason yep. why I'm asking is that some people would say, well, if you're getting $30,000 more to reimburse expenses, then it should go to reimburse expenses. Mm -hmm. So your answer actually helps me to clarify, at least make to the public, it's unrelated to the expenses related to it, so we might be able to explore additional services. Correct, correct. Um, as far as the Operation Hope thing, what I would say is, is that we have done that without taxpayer funding, and I would like to continue down that avenue. I, th I, think, um, I think we're going to be at a place to kind of shift gears here a little bit, I'm hoping, in the near future. We've been working with Mercy Hospital and uh, in Portland, South Portland, and Westbrook on a collaborative effort that would, uh, and that's gone to the governor of the office to try to get some funding, some, some uh, at least initial funding, and to put together a program that would involve detox, treatment, both medical assisted and, and, uh, and abstinence based, um, safe sober living, uh, you know, work, uh, life skills, the whole 
gamut, which is obviously more than what we're able to, to accomplish now, and is really what is needed. And if that, in fact, takes shape, then we're going to be more of a portal than anything else, and we probably won't have the um, resource commitment or the, the transportation commitment that we have now. And just to expand on my bleeding heart liberal position on this, is that I'm not going to hold out for the governor or the <laughs> And the success that you've had with that program is, um, 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 I don't even know how to explain it, it has been so, so exceptional. <coughs> Can you just imagine what we could have accomplished with actual funding into the program? So that's why I was, when minute you said that good news, I was like, oh, this is a great opportunity. So, Well, I appreciate that. And, and I would hope, um, I would hope that although it might not be direct related, that maybe later on when we have that staffing uh, discussion, that maybe this, that will uh, come into play. Okay. Um, because one of the other things that I think we're lacking, I've, I've told you I think we're lacking with the traffic enforcement. One of the other things that really bothers me is that we have said right along that this, um, and the, I gave you the good news coming back from Hyder. I, I, I guess I got to tell you the bad news is that <laughs> this problem isn't going anywhere. Yeah. It's uh, it's getting it's getting worse. Yeah. And by all uh, by all accounts from the analysts that study this kind of thing, it's going to get worse before it gets better. And um, what's uh, What's so troubling about that is the people that we're having coming in through the door and we're having those discussions with them and we're finding out that, you know, uh, some of these folks are, although they may be 28 or 29 now, um, started with uh, with pretty hard drugs younger and younger. I mean, we're talking about 12 and 13 years old that these people are starting to, starting to do heroin and cocaine and hard drugs. And that's pretty scary. And Last year we talked about um, a school resource officer for the Wentworth School and we opted not to do that and, and with good reason. Um, and, and I'm not advocating for a school resource officer, but I think this whole problem, we've got to have a three-pronged solution to this problem. And it's got to have enforcement, it's got to have treatment, and it's got to have prevention. And one of the things that I'm really struggling with is how do we get to those younger grades and so forth. And I, I, I'm, you know, Again, when it comes to resources, I'm looking at what can we do to try to get somebody into those schools. Years ago, we used to go to the K-2 schools and do bike safety and do Halloween safety and winter safety in those programs. And it wasn't the program that was so much important. It was the relationships that we built with those kids and, and um, you know, some of, the, some of the skills that we could teach them along the way that hopefully would maybe help as they get older. And... Um, and of course, we we do have uh, the fifth grade dare program and so forth. So, I think there would be a natural, and we wouldn't need to assign somebody to a school. But I think that we could use somebody in a capacity to do more things with the kids at younger ages through the school, and hopefully reach them before anybody else does. Thank you. So, so along the staffing lines, if I could, and this is kind mm -hmm. of manifesting, and I think in the revenue side of things as we're looking at here, I, I call them more nuisance violations than anything else. We're seeing, you know, the animal issues and fireworks and plovers and things. And, I mean, we're, we're getting, those are the things that we're all getting calls on and stuff, I think. Right. Um, and, I, I mean, I, I don't want to belittle that issue at all. I know they're a bigger picture and more pressing matters, but I'm wondering if, you know, what kind of staffing levels we could look at to to address some of those issues, because it seems like staffing being short, we've got to prioritize everything, and, and these things completely understandably so fall fairly down low on the list when we're dealing with some of the other big picture issues. Mm -hmm. um, so I, I guess one of the things I'd be looking at is, is when we have that staffing discussion of what it might take to do some increased enforcement in the in those types of <clears throat> excuse me, in those type of issues because if we've got them on the books and they are ordinances, yep. we, I think we need to enforce them some way, somehow. Certainly. Um, so maybe that's the discussion we'll have around the staffing is when it's appropriate. Mm -hmm. <clears throat> and, and some of that, when we get to the, uh, the expense side of the budget, some of that is built in this year, um, particularly at the beaches uh, for the uh, parking enforcement and so forth. We've expanded the hours there uh, to to take care of that, the parking issues, particularly at Higgins. And um, so, yeah, I, I'd be glad to, 
to discuss that then. Um, the expense side of the budget, there's, there's um, not really a lot to it. Um, I'll be happy to go down any of the lines that you want to and take a look, um, but <coughs> yes, just Ben, <coughs> just from a high level view. So, so overall, your your wage increases are 7.4 percent. So wage the and benefits. Wage and benefits. Wage and benefits. Yeah, wage and benefits. Um, and um, you know, and I think you put it in there that the color is 1.8. There's probably two percent or so for performance and other things. I know. And then you mentioned Higgins Beach or patrol on the beaches. Is that so? J just how do you go <coughs> from about a three percent overall wage increase to seven? What are some of those other components that are driving that number upward? Higgins Beach is how much? Is that eighteen, twenty thousand that we got it's in? Eighteen thousand. Yeah. Eighteen thousand. Yeah. Okay. And and um, when you mentioned uh, the the one point eight, that's true of the non contractual people. But yeah. remember that all of our people, well, not all of our people, but the majority of our people are in one of two unions, yep. which have, uh, we'll, we'll be going into the second year of a three-year contract, so there are built-in increases there that are more than that, uh, more than that 1.8%. Right. Police and dispatch for this coming year are 2.5% two two both, both units. With, with coal or without? So are the coals on top of it? No, that's flat. flat. It's, it's flat. It's flat. So still, I mean, I, so I, I just, from a 30,000 mile view, how do we go from Three to four percent increases sure. to seven point four. I, I know Higgins sure. Beach is part of it. Higgins Beach, but, that, is, but that's not Higgins that's Beach not a is part number. of it. The salary, uh, the contracts that give them the uh, the two point five plus there's steps built into the contract. We have the MDEA position is now shown in here, so that's a whole new position. The eighty nine thousand dollars that we talked about over on the revenue side. There's expenses that go with that. Oh, so, so part of this is offset by, yes. by revenue. Okay. Yes. So there, there's 89 that's offset? I'm sorry? Was it offset last year? No, this was the first year. This is the first year. So it's yeah. 89 there. Okay. Yep. What else, what else you got that's coming? Um, <coughs> health insurance at 5%. Yeah, health insurance. Yeah, that's, okay. Um, pension related, as salaries go up, pension mm -hmm. contributions go up. Like a Medicare, they all go up yeah. with yeah. those salaries. And no. there's nothing else in there, though. That's, that's yeah. What I'd like to yeah, do. Yeah, there's no there's no new positions or anything like that. It's all. What yeah. I'd like to do because this is a reassuring theme, I expect yeah, yeah. the same concern yeah. throughout. Um, we can actually provide a breakdown in one of the future departments, just so you can see the component parts. That'd be great. Um, just to send, yeah, that'd be great. I, I I really try to isolate those problem. that are driving sure. a higher than anticipated number. Sure. Sure. I, I think it would be beneficial across all the departments to yeah. see the wages, then benefits. Uh, have that number broken out as instead of one lump sum percentages because, I, I mean, it, it, again, it, when we're starting, w when the contracts are being negotiated, there are multiple facets of those contracts, mm -hmm. wages plus benefits plus pensions and things like that. So it's, I think it's important for us to be able to see if our, if our benefits are outpacing our, our salaries, let's say, um, which I'm sure they are. They typically are in most contracts. Mm -hmm. <clears throat> that's something to look at and to be able to target for future sure. contract. All of that issues. detail is certainly in line item, but we'll yeah. simplify it yeah. and provide you a, a very specific breakdown of yeah. uh, this wage and benefit category, just so you have a sense of what are those components. But do that for all the departments, yeah. all the budgets. So you'd have one table. I believe we can do that. Basically, eight yeah. departments, and then you know whether it's yeah. wages, yeah. whatever. That, that would certainly help me. And there'll be some outliers. You know, every it's mm -hmm. this DEA position that's a unique thing. But well, yeah. I mean that's what I'm looking for. The yeah. things that are yeah. that are outside that are working in the numbers, so we can the, try the, to see the, those the things, things that are outside, other than the like health and and FICAR and Medicare and mm -hmm. uh, contractual things, are, are simply the addition of the <coughs> MDA position. Um, in the expanded Higgins Beach. In the expanded Higgins Beach. Yeah. Okay. Yeah. Thank you. Yes. Thank you. <coughs> so, Chief, I sorry, I just had one question on sure. uh, the um, police services side. In one of your budget drivers, you said salary adjustment costs for full-time positions to be determined by contractual negotiations. Does that mean that we have an, a couple of open contracts right now that we haven't concluded, or does that mean that's just going to be? No, I think forward? I think that was just the language didn't get changed from. Okay. Uh, yeah. Okay. So there's no open contracts right now that no. aren't being negotiated. Everything's finalized. No, nope, we set. have. Uh, we're going into the second year, three-year contract. Um, so no, there are not. Okay. That was just a. Sorry about that. That was my no. fault. We didn't uh, change the <coughs> context on that. Any other questions for the chief? I, again, I, I'm just. Um, I'm. I'm 
because of the standard bearer kind of a, um, budget we have, I'm more interested in talking about the long-term or upcoming short-term problems that we have with staffing. So I'll reserve everything around that for that that time. Will be towards the end of the budget. We do have uh, a couple of items in um, capital equipment and one in capital. So that's tab six, page seven. Which one is that? Is that equipment? Capital or? equipment. Three items. Yeah. The first is the. I'll wait till you get there. Oh, go ahead. The first is a taser equipment program, and the request is to fund uh, six replacement uh, tasers. The current tasers are five years old, and they've reached their warranty expiration. <coughs> and this is a multi-year until we get them all replaced. Um, they are, as it says, electrical devices, and they do tend to have issues. And so it's uh, it's time for for us to piece those out. The <coughs> Next one is the uh, narcotics and identification system. It's called the True Narc uh, Narcotics System, and the this is really an officer safety issue. You know, the you watch the old shows where they dip their finger in the baggie and taste it, and you know, yeah, that's the. Uh, <laughs> <laughs> You're not encouraging that anymore. <laughs> yeah, no, no, we don't. Need to. <laughs> But what happens is, what happens is the testing that we have now, the presumptive testing that we have now, people do need to, officers do need to open up a baggie or something, and now we're we're seeing heroin laced with fentanyl and things that are very very toxic, and just getting some on your fingers and so forth can can be deadly, um, and so these TrueNOC systems give us the ability to, it's done with lasers, so you don't even have to open the plastic bag. Mm -hmm. um, and I think it does 300 yeah. different yeah. drugs or whatever. Mm -hmm. So you can take the bag, you can run the, uh, it against mm -hmm. the TrueNOC and so forth and get a presumptive test. Now it still has to go to the lab and be, if it's a court case, it's still gonna have to go to the lab and come back and be verified. Um, but it at least gives it the, the probable cause to make the arrest and so mm -hmm. forth, and it gives an indication as to what it is. So we know what kind of a substance that we're dealing with, because there's so much out there today we just don't know. Mm -hmm. And it's uh, so truly for me, it's it's keeping our folks safe. You know, we're seeing more and more of this. We're asking them to enforce these kinds of cases and deal with these kinds of situations. And I I think it's necessary to make sure that. We can keep it as safe as we can. So, are these mobile units that the officers will carry with them? It's one unit. It's one unit. It's one unit. So they'd have to come back to the station or a central processing area to, to test. Correct. And then, okay. Correct. Okay. Yep. And then the uh, third item was the uh, cruiser light bars. Um, the current light bars were, were purchased for the Crown Vicks, and um, the I think uh, Dave might be able to speak to this a little sure. better, but. Public Works does a great job with our equipment, as you know, course, from yeah. the other departments. Um, but what we're being told now is that these are getting to the point where they're no longer able to get parts and so forth because the technology's changed so much, the LED and all of that kind of thing, the controllers are different. And sure. The, the units that we have currently are between eight and nine years old, and uh, like the chief mentioned, they were designed and we purchased them specifically for the uh, cruisers that were cars, the Crown Vicks. Mm -hmm. And currently, we're transitioning over to a complete SUV for a mark patrol fleet. The technology for uh, what we own currently is no longer available. Um, they're working currently, but the parts, if we were to have problems, this includes money for eight units, and it includes not only the light bars, but the controllers for the, uh, the light bars that are uh, used for the op by the officers. Um, it also, we'd be able to, the design is a little bit different with going to this type of unit to mount it on an SUV as far as um, for visibility and things like that. And as the chief mentioned, technology obviously has uh, just improved over time as well. So will this cover the, all of the marked fleet, or will you going to have to do a supplemental next year or additional next year? Or is this, no, will this cover we, we have eight marked patrol units in the fleet, and this would be to purchase units for all eight of those vehicles. Okay. The other thing is, too, with the change in technologies and how they set up the lights and so forth, the ones that we have now are fairly high, 
and uh, and the newer ones are are lower and smaller bulbs and so forth, but they still give the illumination, and um, so it's a little bit better for gas mileage and so forth too. Uh, and we don't propose to finance any of those items. <laughs> And then for projects, there is just one on tab seven, page six. This is for uh, air conditioner controller and water heater. Uh, we had a problem and we need to replace that. Um, Mala has some good news with that because instead of 10,000, it looks like it would be 2,000. Mm -hmm. They actually have taken um, they took the unit out of the ceiling and replaced it with a loaner one that they had and took it back to their shop and they were able to Re reset it, reboot it, re do, hmm? do something. What they thought had failed just actually needed to be rebooted. That's good news. So <clears throat> we don't need the $8,000 to buy a replacement unit to go back into the ceiling. The one we have is working fine now. Hmm. Great. Remove that. Uh, no, it goes to $2,000 because yeah. we still need the water heater. We still need the water heater. <laughs> there might be ways to do that between now and the end of the year. You uh, can't pipe it off the tri -gen we'll, with the cooling we'll water jacket? <laughs> <laughs> Good, that's great news. That is great Thank you. Sorry, what's A stand for again? Air conditioning? Appropriation. 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 Oh, okay. The other, the other thing I would say is that, uh, and, and I don't want to speculate on exactly what the numbers will look like right now. I certainly can have that discussion when we come back to talk about staffing, but um, we did have some open positions that when we built the budget, and we, when we built the budget, we built it with worst case scenario. So by contract, I can hire people up to step three if they have experience and so forth. And of course, there's differences in the insurance plans. So when we budget these things, we budget for worst case step three, with a family plan. Um, some of those, we're starting to get some clarity around those positions and so forth, so there may be some some savings along in there, too. So. Yeah, there's potentially three different positions that there might be savings of one sort or another that uh, we need to refine, and I think we'll bring back some news in the future. Would those be significant enough to warrant a, an additional position, to cover the cost of an additional position, or are we talking relatively marginal? Possibly. Close. Okay. Mm. Okay. Maybe not all of it, but very close. Okay. I have a question on the capital projects. I don't know. I don't have page uh, page six on mine. Yeah. Just that. So uh, you've been kind to include a forward-looking assessment um, around the public safety building I apologize. of 18. Yeah. No, don't apologize. That's actually <laughs> thoughtful. Um, of 18 million. Um, I was just wondering. One is that fully loaded because my understanding is that the request would actually cover both fire and police. So yeah. is that fully loaded for both departments? Yeah, that would be all okay. yeah. yeah. I just want to make sure. I intended to I intended to hit on that. That's uh that's something that we've had as a placeholder I think since uh since 2003 we updated uh, the cost based in, we had done some work around uh space analysis and so forth and actually even looked at some preliminary plans before. And so we took those uh, spatial needs and applied uh, the latest construction cost a couple of years ago, so updated that number. Obviously, it's out there a couple of years, but uh, it's it's there, and that would be a complete public safety. We feel um, that we gain a lot from the relationship that we have, and there's a lot of uh, places for efficiencies by having the two departments together. So, yep. certainly, there will be a greater discussion. And you'll Absolutely. know <laughs> on the CIC there are two other kind of building-related things, and I keep. I feel bad because I keep telling them, you know, I don't want them to dive into that place because I, I don't <laughs> expect you're going to be there long term. So right. for um, ten years, he keeps hearing the same thing. <laughs> I have had initial discussions with Chairman Donovan about how to start restart that process, and um, perhaps later in this year, uh, the council might consider might be asked to consider forming an ad hoc group to start getting together and thinking about site selection and some of the space need analysis, and there are some reserve resources that you have access to, non-tax, that are from a prior land sale. So uh, stay tuned. I think we'd like to get that started earlier than later. It's probably a year and a half in process. At least. Okay. Yeah. Yeah. You're right. Okay. I'm good. Uh, we're all set. Thank, Thank you very much. Thank, Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. Appreciate it. The next group is planning. So, uh, Chief Mullen, you're going to have to reconcile the 15 minutes that we're over with the uh, planning department. <laughs> <laughs>
Do you want to take a break? You're all set? Still good? I think we're all set. Okay. Good. Okay. Good. I'm good. good. So I presume you know Mr. Bacon? You've seen him a couple times? Yeah, yeah a couple uh, times. Yeah. Although uh, we're not used to talking finance with him. <laughs> Nor is he. So, uh, <laughs> <laughs> Might stump me. We're planning in the budget. <laughs> It's on page 33. Three and 30. Yes, yeah, sorry. Oh. Well, I'm at right. expenditures. Yeah. Eight expenditures, yeah. Oh, yeah. for revenues? Yeah. Well, who's it after? Or I can't find it. Uh, and revenues? Oh, it's on page 33. 33. Tab 4, 33 and 37. <laughs> <laughs> oh. Yeah. Do you have some prepared comments? You can start. Go ahead. Excellent. Um, well, thank you. I'm Dan Bacon, Planning Director, and thanks for the opportunity to present uh, both operating budget, CIP, and the like. Um, I don't have any particular highlights. Um, I think you see me enough. I figure that uh, we interact a lot uh, at your regular council meetings. I think the, the relatively new format of the budget uh, narratives is great because that way you can read uh, in a comprehensive way successes and accomplishments from this past year if some of them weren't involving the council and then goals and priorities for the coming year. So. I'm happy to talk about any of those that you'd like, but I wasn't going to particularly highlight highlight any. There are a few that are in um, under CIPs and are related to the budget. So um, unless you have any questions, I'll, I'll jump right into to revenues um, and then expenditures and from there. I guess in terms of revenues, um, this year, this current year is tracking um, well ahead of projected revenues. So we're now probably looking at a 20 or 25 percent um, overage over what we anticipated or budgeted in last year's revenues. That's really due to, I think, a strong uh, construction industry in Scarborough. It's, it's, um, there's a lot going on. There's a lot of residential development. Um, there's more multifamily type development as well as commercial. So, like I said, we're probably 20 to 25 percent ahead on building permits, plumbing, electrical in particular. Building permits are our our biggest uh, revenue source. And so in light of that, in light of what's in front of the planning board right now, that would be looking for permits in next fiscal year in light of the inquiries we're getting as well as the current permitting trend, we are projecting um, about a 5% increase over uh, last year's revenues. I think that's conservative. I, I would hazard a guess that it's going to be closer to 10, but we don't want to be too optimistic. Sometimes we see some blips where we have a, a busy year and then it'll come down a little bit. So I think a 5% increase is, is certainly um, conservative and, and likely and perhaps we're ahead of that. So that's really kind of the story of revenues. They're, I'm projecting a, a decrease in the Zoning Board of Appeals revenues, which isn't a big source anyway because of the Higgins Beach effort. Um, we're going to see last appeals to the, to the board in light of that now being an administrative process so that they're not involved. So um, that explains that, that reduction. Would you like me to keep moving and make up for time? Uh, in terms of expenses and appropriations, there's not a there's not a lot here. There's not a lot much of a dramatic change or increase. Um, we do have some salary and benefit adjustments that are really kind of a matter of matter of course. Um, they're really based on some in the COLA adjustments um, and our staff meeting expectations. We actually had a reduction in salary last year because we had some. I uh, had a, few, a retirement and some change of staff where we hired uh, some younger staff or newer staff or at lower at lower rates um, than the preceding staff. So that's, uh, that was, I think, a 2% reduction last year. And so that actually is influencing increase in benefits this year. They're younger employees that have um, families versus older that didn't. So there's more... Uh, in terms of family benefits. That, that's demonstrating why there's, it's a, maybe a bit higher than some other departments. I think it's at maybe 4% versus 3%. So um, that's the, that accounts for that component of um, the expenses or appropriations. There's not a lot of other things I really need to highlight. I'm happy to answer any particular questions. Maybe two 
small adjustments this year. We're expecting the state to uh, switch over to a new new building code, which requires us to buy, um, you know, four to six volumes of, of building code. So we're increasing by almost two thousand dollars, eighteen hundred dollars, our books and periodicals uh, line item, which is likely a one-year thing. Um, and then on the flip side, we're and it's something that we're proud of. We've been transitioning our, uh, some of our inspection vehicles over to all-electric uh, Nissan Leafs. We have, we have two now, and so that's enabling us to save on um, vehicle fuel. And so we're projecting or, or requesting you know, $900, $1,000 less for uh, our fuel budget, which isn't a huge budget, but it's 25%. And we're relying on the new TriGen facility to generate um, inexpensive electricity. So, so Dan, if I could go back to the new codes for the for the state, the new sure. building codes. Yeah. Um, do you expect a, is it a radical revision or is it just an update in standard? So, are we going to need people to relearn entire sections of code, or is it just we're they're tweaking a few subchapters, that kind of stuff? Yeah, it's not a or? it's not a radical okay. update. It's there's <coughs> international built. International building codes, which are standardized throughout the nation, and it's going from, I think, the 2009 to the 2013 version. So it's, you know, fine adjustments in building practices. So it's not yeah, a wholesale replacement. Just okay. a right. Yeah. And it's statewide. So town to town, contractors need to use the same code, and so it's dictated by mm -hmm. the main the main state building. Yeah, I was just wondering if we would need additional staff time, training time, that kind of stuff, if it's a whole new code, if you've got to go off to you know, learn the nuances of it or something. There's, no, there shouldn't be um, significant increases in training. No. Okay. Any questions on uh, appropriations? So, elsewhere in your your budget books, um, there's we have two different groups of CIPs, a couple in each. Um, I guess capital equipment is the first one. Page six. Page six. Uh, I mentioned vehicles earlier. Um, there is a, a request for a new a new vehicle, and this is different than our all-electric kind of sedan type vehicles. This is it. This is for our shared position, our commercial code officer and fire inspector, who <coughs> works for both departments and performs duties for both departments. Um, that vehicle that Jim Butler, who's in that position, uses is become a pretty big liability in terms of maintenance costs. It's 13 years old. It's, it's hurting our, our annual budget around uh, repairs and maintenance. And it, for as well as we do with electric vehicles, it's terrible on gas mileage. It's, you know, in the, it's in the low teens in terms of gas mileage. So um, Public Works has been, who maintains the, the vehicle, has been saying for a few years now it's time to to um, put that one up for auction and invest in a new one. Um, the reason we're specking a, a uh, Ford Explorer is there's a, a couple different reasons. One is this position actually responds to emergencies um, fairly often, I think multiple times a week, depending on the situation. So it, Jim Butler is also a fire, a fireman in addition to a code enforcement officer. So. Um, it could be during the day, it could be on weekends or, or nights that he's responding to emergencies. Um, so he's carrying around at all times his gear um, and equipment in the vehicle, much like Chief Thurlow kind of talked about the, um, the Tahoes earlier about having space for that. So this is a bit smaller than those vehicles, but has the room for that emergency response gear. Um, and we also, um, while we have some kind of two-wheel drive sedans need uh, a four-wheel drive vehicle for kind of weather conditions and construction sites and, and things of that nature. So um, this is what after some discussion with a variety of different vehicles, um, Jay Nason at Public Works recommended um, in light of the needs of this particular position. And also it's starting to become standardized because it's the same same uh, vehicle that PD is using essentially um, for their patrol vehicle. So there's some standardization in terms of understanding the vehicle and maintenance by um, Public Works. Um, so yeah, they, they are six cylinder too. So there's a, 
it's not a bad uh, gas mileage associated right. with the right. vehicle as well. But right. Well, I guess I have a similar question more for Tom, I think. Uh, is there any way to get some kind of, it sounds like, you know, between police, if the, if the police is going to SUV type of arrangements, fires using them, you know, uh, if there's a way to do it, a, you know, a bulk standardization yeah, across the town. Uh, in fact, Mike Shaw, he used to drive a pickup truck as far as his, yeah. his vehicle. Um, he's now driving one of these. Um, it's essentially the same vehicle without... Um, all the bells and whistles. Of the so we are we are doing that then. We are yep. we're doing like a, a town wide standardization, yep. if you will. For okay. Yep. Um, do you want me to keep moving? Yes, please. Yep. Keep following. The other capital equipment, and it's it's not necessarily equipment, but it falls under this category, is um, a proposed update to the front customer area in the code enforcement and planning department, um, and this is really aimed at frankly, better customer service. Right now, um, there's really only room for one customer to be waited on at a time, while we have two administrative staff who can wait on customers, and also often there's people coming to the front counter that um, want to meet with other staff. And just the layout of the counter space doesn't allow for kind of efficiently waiting on customers and dealing with multiple customers at a, at a time. So sometimes there can be a line to, to even to get served in our in our office. Um, so that's one piece of it. The other piece of it is there's not much space for actually people waiting to see other staff um, in the waiting area. And we have a lot of uh, real estate agents and other customers who come in who don't actually need to see staff, but they need to roll out plans or research files or um, and investigate things, and there there really isn't adequate s space in that area to do that. So that's kind of on the customer size side, where a reconfiguration can really enable improvements in all three or four of those areas. The other side is on the administrative and the staff side. Um, the office space is configured so that both administrative assistants right now don't face the public. Um, so one's back is to the public, which isn't ideal for um, greeting, greeting customers, and we have a antiquated kind of copy room that really is in the middle of that space that serves no purpose and is, is, um, could be much more efficiently used. So the idea is to open up that whole area and have um, better space for the employees, better um, filing space, and, and actually a, a part-time space for the code officer I mentioned earlier who's often in the fire department but then in our department where he can have a, a desk and a, a better workstation. So uh, the aim is really to improve the space all around for customers that come in as well as the, the staff that are always greeting them and interacting with them. Um, so that's, that's that proposal. Um, and a lot of questions. The last category are CIP projects, and there's two proposed for uh, this coming fiscal year. There's a couple others, the, the following, and I'll obviously focus on the two for this year. <clears throat> One of them, we actually did a workshop uh, with the council not too long ago, and that's the Eastern Trail Project. This is um, a long time in the making, and as we presented to the council, like I said, a month or so ago, it's a very complex project, and it's a very uh, expensive project, and we've gotten a lot of incredible support funding-wise from Maine DOT and PACS, our regional transportation funding provider, um, close to, close to $2.7 million of the $3.7 million needed to do the project. Um, part of... Uh, when PACS provides funding to local municipalities, they expect a local match. So the proposal here is a $216,000 uh, from the town of Scarborough to meet the, the match requirement for the PACS contribution. Um, that's important to, to, to secure that PACS funding, and it's also obviously important to get us closer to the to the $3.7, $3.8 million overall project cost. Um, the, that said, you know, there's still six to 
six hundred to eight hundred thousand dollars that we're needing, and um, Councillor Pays is well aware in participating with the. Uh, a, basically a funding campaign group that um, Tom and I are also working with to strategize around how to privately fundraise uh, that, that remaining the remaining gap and we have a, I think a really good strategy around that and some momentum behind it I actually met at lunchtime with a, a potential donor who could provide um, wetland crossings in a, in, and avoid that those costs so we're we're looking at a myriad of ways of um, closing the funding gap, but just as importantly is to to get the local match from the town of Scarborough and, and to, to hopefully get the $200,000 plus to to continue to kind of close the um, the funding gap. So, so Tom, I noticed you wanted to bond that. That's a, uh, that's what the B is on that, correct? Um, so, is there? I think we had discussed it when we had our workshop too about. Um, how we wouldn't necessarily issue the bonds until the project was fully funded and approved. We would just earmark that. So if they weren't capable of raising the additional money within a certain period of time, that commitment, if you will, would expire and then we'd have to go through the process again or something like that. I'm, I mean, I'm talking years out, not... We wouldn't bond it now well, and we'll then put it... sooner than later. Okay. Um, if the money's not raised in 12 months or so, um, the project's not going to happen near term. So okay. if it happens on occasion where we have budget authority, uh, but we don't act on that until we, you know, all the other factors fall in place. Um, and on occasion, in fact, I think this finance committee's yep. heard this in the past, we've come back to you with a host of projects to say, you know, these didn't go anywhere, we needed yep. to rescind that budget authority yep. because Kate and Gina have to keep kicking it year over year. Yep. Okay. Um, we also did an analysis just to appreciate what would, uh, what's our level of investment through the years, including this investment in the trail, comparatively to other communities that have the trail passed through it. So on one hand, we're, you could say we're burdened by the fact that it exists here, but it's a regional resource. Uh, why aren't others paying? Uh, but it's also a tremendous uh, benefit to us, I would argue. I think it's a, a very valuable um, recreational asset. And um, I can provide this to you, but certainly uh, the, the city of Saco and mm -hmm. South Portland has contributed similar amounts um, through the years with the various projects. So this is not kind of out of line. Uh, we appreciate it's a big ask of residents, but I think there's a huge return to us and undoubtedly the region. Yeah. Yeah. Um, and the last CIP that's in here, it's, it's not an infrastructure project. It's actually uh, a capital improvement project related to beginning the update to our comprehensive plan. This is something that we're required to do every 10 to 12 years and our last plan was approved in um, 2006 and so um, SEDCO, the Long Range Planning Committee and, and myself and our department have been working hard to sort of strategize what is the process to update the comprehensive plan and our uh, strategy at this point is over the next year to kind of really build the baseline for policy discussions the following year for the comprehensive plan and the two kind of key components to that that we really feel we need some outside consultant help um, to execute is really a, a fiscal analysis, um, really a contemporary growth and services report. The town actually did a growth and a very comprehensive <coughs> growth and services report in the early 2000s that looked at all the different types of development in Scarborough and what their the fiscal implications of them are, you know, what their tax revenue is and what their demands are for services. A lot's changed in 15 years um, in terms of the type of development we're seeing and also its, its fiscal implications. Um, and that's um, that's something that I really think that an outside group should do that has outside perspective and outside expertise. Um, and it has other areas that it will inform, not just the comprehensive plan, but it's in part the baseline for our impact fee for schools. We have a school impact fee uh, right now that might need to be updated in terms of how that's proportioned based on types of residential units. Um, it also can guide us in terms of, you know, the, the sort of the state um, aid to education and, and give us some ideas. There's a lot of discussion at first reading last week about where we're headed um, in that regard and I think this, this can really give the town some ideas around what types of development we want to 
attract, promote, um, what types we might want to, um, you know, curtail, and, and everything in between. So it's something that really can give us some good direction for policy making, I think, at the council level and the comprehensive plan level. Um, the other piece that will likely play a big role in the next comp plan is transportation. You know, we did a very comprehensive transportation study, and again, in early 2000s, and it needs to be looked at again. And um, so having some outside assistance with kind of laying the framework for that is, is pretty critical for decisions the, the second year in terms of the comp plan and policy making. So that's, that's the background as to why this is in as a CIP for some consultant funding. It's certainly going to be a lot of additional in-house work by staff and SEDCO and the Long Range Planning Committee and perhaps you know, some counselors around and other committees for that matter contributing to other inventories and other things related to the comp plan. So it's more than just this effort, but this is sort of specialized um, assistance that I think can, can pay dividends for the community. So, so what are sort of the pros and cons if we were to push it out a year? The pros and cons, um, well, I mean, there's, in terms of the comp plan and having one that's current, it's important to have a current comprehensive plan for kind of state level funding when we apply for grants um, for certain things when development projects come in for um, for different types of projects and they, they apply for outside money, particularly like main housing type money, the Avesta project that uh, was approved by the council last year. Those projects like that and town projects that require, again, state level funding and other funding often need to have a current comprehensive plan. So if we move past our 10 to 12 year window, you know, that becomes, that can be kind of jeopardized. But, but if we push it out a year, we'd still be in the 12 year window, right? Well, this is a two year, um, this would be a two year process. So if we started comp plan preparation, say, in July, that would bring us to um, July of 17. There's 11 and then, years. Yeah, it would be, we wouldn't complete the comp plan because the second year would be actually working on the comp, comp plan policy. So we'd be, depends on how quickly we do the comp plan. But we'd be close on the 12-year yeah. the window. Yep. Yep. Yeah, just as money, <coughs> there will be a challenge to balance. You've already heard tonight, you know, other requests for funds. Oh, sure. Trying to figure out. And this is appropriation, so it's fund balance somewhere, right? Tom, is the way you get this. Let's raise the taxation. It's, it's appropriation. Okay. It affects the tax rate. Yeah. yeah. So I, I guess unless you, you also. No, I'm sorry. Sorry. Yeah. sorry. Um, so two quick questions. Number one, um, the the fifty-five thousand dollars is that. Uh, do you think that will get us where we need in terms of all the consulting fees to get us where we need to be, or are we looking for another ask probably next year to offset that some more? It's a two-year. Request the first yep. year is fifty-five thousand for this fiscal analysis work. Yep. And transportation analysis work. And, and then thirty or fifty-five the following. And then fifty-five well, the right. following would be the actual putting the comp plan together, facilitating public meetings, um, and and actually the doing the policy making and having some consultant guidance for that. Okay. So it's a two-year. Proposal. Okay, and then this, I guess the second question is: Is why would that go into the capital side of things and not the operations budget? Let's say for consulting services or purchasing or something like that. It could. One of the reasons, one of the primary reasons we have a capital budget is this kind of expense would be a, a blip on the on the radar. Yep. Um, because it's funded from appropriation, it has no no difference from a tax point of view. Yep. Not looking to hide it anywhere. Right. Right. Um, right. We just. Uh, for comparative purposes, I'd, I'd like to segregate out these kind of one or two year expenses that can be the tail that wags the dog if we can. Yep. Uh, so we can truly see things over time, apples to apples. That's the only reason it's here. Okay. Yeah, that makes sense. So just, just yeah, I pushed Dan pretty hard on this, thinking that we might be able to grab another year, and he pushed back uh, even harder to me. Um, <laughs> Sense that. <laughs> no, it, but it was persuasive in that this is an important thing. Um, town is found out the hard way how important it is to have a good comp plan and follow it, and we don't want to repeat that. And it, this is the pre-work that really needs to be done be before we engage the community and actually do the work of the, the plan update. Um, and this clock is ticking, so it passed my test and this is in front of you for consideration. 
but just the other kind of um, tagline on this comp plan too is it's the intention with this comp plan is to try to accomplish a lot of other things at the same time. Like we had, we had a comp plan that was very successful from 2006 that we've implemented. And so this is really trying to um, accomplish a lot more, like a fiscal analysis and like some kind of localized transportation planning around Oak Hill, around Dunstan, in critical areas. So. Um, you know, if it wasn't a comp plan kind of update process and we pushed it out, maybe we'd then be kind of looking at a transportation study around some of these things in the next few years. So we're trying to bundle other initiatives into this so that it gets as much as we can out of a comp plan process and mobilizes people at once for a variety of things. Um, so, and we can talk more kind of offline about what the nuts and bolts are of the comp plan process. and and get input from the council as to what you want to see in it because right now we're still at the infancy of what it should look like and so the more input from you okay. as policymakers on what you want to accomplish in the comp plan um, can really shape shape what it looks like and make sure it's you know get get as much bang for our buck in terms of this investment if we decide to do it you might recall some conversation a couple months back on the star communities program mm -hmm. we bought in kind of the minimal entry, if you will, to mm. simply get access to their framework. And we're going to use that at the staff level and long-range planning to start the warm-up exercise to kind of um, get moving in this direction. Uh, that's yep. kind of a parallel initiative that I see over the next year as well. Yep. I, uh, just two basic comments and then a question. Um, the comprehensive plan is a state mandate, so it's necessary to update and to uh, put that into place of course, how much it costs us is up to us to determine, but I think it's money well spent. And it's well spent because, as Tom alluded to, th this town has been sued, um, or it was cited in a legal case in which our comprehensive plan wasn't updated, um, which caused um, a big community um, uproar <coughs> or outspeak or however you want to describe that. So I think that, um, while it may seem somewhat innocuous, it's very important for the community to develop that. And second, on the Eastern Trail, um, I know that this has been an issue that has been attempted to be brought up in the past. I'm personally very happy to see that in here. Um, I, I really want to see, and I'm hoping that the fundraising piece is very, very successful because it will bring that whole project to fruition mm -hmm. that's been going on for almost 20 years. Um, the observation or, or question I have is, because um, I have gotten a couple of comments from citizens, uh, a couple of years back, we had the question around the reassessment of the entire town, mm -hmm. which was, I think, originally consulting fees around $400,000. Have we given up on that in, no. in, 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 in any of our planning? I don't know. It's out. It's out uh, 18 or 19? In 18, we'll be coming to you. I didn't see that. Did I miss the um, chart? Is that assessing? assessing? Under assessing instead it's of, okay, I was looking at planning. All right, sorry. Yeah, Mike, uh, uh, Sam will oversee that. That's okay, I'll look at it. I'll look for it later. Don't bother. But no, it's not dropped off. Okay. We need to do it. I didn't see it. Thank you. We need to go at it a little differently. Uh, Last time we went, the voters turned it down pretty soundly. So I think there needs to be a better education campaign around that, around the need for it. Uh, or reduce cost. <laughs> I'll say it. Or both. Or both. Or both. So outside of that, um, any other questions for Mr. Bacon or Tom on so planning? I said one. Code. We do. We are quick. Uh, I know we're going to talk about positions at a later meeting, yep. but I was going to highlight uh, a shared position that is proposed by our department, Public Works and Community Services, and we very much struggled with the name. So we know it's a, maybe a loaded name of Sustainability Coordinator. Um, and so rather than kind of dwell on the name, we've at that future meeting kind of want to talk about the, the functions and duties. And yeah, that's, really so the, that's really the importance. So we have an energy committee that has a lot of aspirations around saving the town money in terms of our approach to energy, um, renewable energy and uh, alternative energy and the like. So that's a piece of the job description for this position. Um, solid waste, recycling, and composting is a, is a piece of the job description for this position to really kind of manage that and, again, uh, along the lines of the town being a leader in, in cost savings around that issue. Um, and the other two kind of focus areas are 
our coastal areas, the, the plover coordinator or beach monitor would be folded into this position. But then taken further to, to really work on our beach health and water quality monitoring. I mean, the beaches are, if anything, our greatest asset in making sure we keep the beaches open um, as many days as possible and having someone that's focused on on that um, and making progress on that. And lastly, really kind of our stormwater compliance um, and being continuing to be progressive around kind of stormwater management. So the coordinator position is, you know, those are things that are would be the thrust of the position and sort of sustainability coordinator was viewed as maybe a term to frame that in, but we're open they're really, for we're open for suggestions and for <laughs> environmental <laughs> compliance coordinator was another one, but um, I think the way to think about it is areas that the town can be pro proactive in and, and, and look at for environmental kind of sustainability, but also kind of fiscal sustainability, like being ahead of these things so that we're saving money um, around all those issues, and that's it's sort of a real proposition that, that could come to fruition. So that's the background um, with it, and, and Mike and I can talk more about it at the appropriate time. Okay, great. Thanks. Thank you very much. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. Unless we have <coughs> tend to be prepared, there is a uh, capital project on the school side that I would like you to entertain uh, some comments on tomorrow's the school's presentation, as you're aware, uh, but Jen's not available for that, so while she's here, I'd like her to speak to that, too. That's kind of at the end of things. I was just saying to these guys back here, I don't know if it's a really good position to be in to be between everybody and dinner. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> like, I'm the last of... Or refreshment. Yeah. <laughs> Whichever the case. Yeah. Um, okay, well, I think this is probably going to be fairly quick because we have a relatively flat budget this year. 1.7% um, increase. That's primarily going to be due to the fact that if you remember when I sat here last year, and we talked about deploying one-to-one -one computers at the high school. I said, I do reserve the right next year to add an additional person, possibly, to help us with that. We have been able to um, kind of rework our pipeline. We did some cross-training throughout the department. We do have eight people within the department. Um, and we've been able to work it so that we don't have to ask for any additional headcount this year. Um, of course, I do reserve that right heading <laughs> forward. Uh, we also did, you'll see a, a little increase in wages and benefits because last year to accommodate that, we did have a fourth person that we hired during the summer to help us with cleaning and imaging and um, getting carts ready, you know, getting all of the devices ready for deployment. So we'll continue with that moving forward. That seems to work well. But that's um, sort of a part-time person that comes in in June and leaves, you know, by the start of school. So minimal compared to actually having to have a full-time person. Um, other than that, even on the school side, we've remained relatively flat. We've taken away some software. We've added some software. Um, I guess we could move to see if you have any questions. Actually, can we start that? on the revenue side, though? Jenna, just have one quick question. Yeah. Um, on the revenue side, you've got um, salary reimbursement. Yeah. I'm trying to figure out, is that the split between municipal and school? Yes. And reimbursement. Okay. All right. So the way that we figure that out is about two or three years ago, we implemented a help desk system, yes. and we track all of the help desk tickets, trying to figure out kind of the percentage of split of how many requests we get from the school side versus how many we get from the municipal side. Yep. That doesn't really account for time spent, so that's sort of a moving target. You know, it's 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 the quantifiable versus mm -hmm. the, you know, qualitative. And very comfortable that I just want to make sure people don't think that that's $475,000 in revenue that's appeared out of nowhere. That's oh, coming from right. the expenditure side yeah. on the school side. So it's, in essence, it's a net wash in the budget process. Yeah. Yeah. And okay. uh, we have a detailed spreadsheet that backs up that number in terms of uh, understands and apportions the cost. Yeah. Uh, Sorry. Did you go back to the, exp the right. expenditures. Go ahead. Okay. Um, so I guess we can move on to capital equipment. Yes. 
Well, um, any any questions from yeah, council for um, expenditures? Yeah, sorry. So you've got in your goals and priorities for for next year, you've got two tech refreshes listed on the on the uh, school side of things. Okay, yeah. K two, complete the K two and begin the MLTI. Yes. So we will complete the K-2. That's a, a process that we've started this year. Okay. We've done um, a number of requirement definition sessions with different folks, different groups throughout the K-2 community. Um, we've identified several different devices. They're in the process of testing them right now. So once we decide on a device, we'll refresh. Their devices currently um, probably range in age from anywhere from four years to seven or eight years old. So they really need to have that refreshed. Um, we are not planning on doing any wholesale refreshes of their AV equipment, so that will stay in place. We're looking at potentially putting some permanent um, projectors in the gyms, but mm -hmm. that's about it. So it's really the devices that we're looking at. Um, that will actually happen. Those will be deployed next year at the beginning of the school year or sometime thereafter. What we're talking about in terms of MLTI is MLTI, so that's the um, main learning technology initiative. MLTI is refreshed every four years. If you remember about three years ago, we refreshed with the HP devices. So coming up in next year will be our year to kind of take a look at that program. We'll find out from the state what they're going to offer. They probably will offer some kind of updated HP device, which I would think, or Windows device, it might not be HP. Um, we'll, we'll stay with some kind of Windows device, but next year will be the year that we'll meet with everybody. We'll kind of talk about what's been going on with MLTI, how happy people are with the devices, and then we'll, we'll choose something from there on out. So that won't be deployed until next year. So this is just in for a planning. We're not doing two right. tech refreshes in no. the same fiscal year. Okay. Right, no. That was that was my question. Okay. And the other interesting thing about the tech refresh and I I don't want to jump, but we're talking about it on in the school CIP that it's in tab seven, page twelve. Uh, just it's an important point because I know this committee, all three of the gentlemen talked about this last year. Uh, school administrators heard loud and clear that uh, and they've tried hard to to identify many of the costs for these annual reoccurring uh, tech refreshes in the operating budget. And perhaps Jen, mm -hmm. speak to that, what it means in fiscal year 17. I think we've, we've sort of been having this ongoing discussion since I've been here, talking about what belongs in operating and what belongs in CIP. Um, you know, the general feeling, I think, across the board was that when we do a tech refresh, um, perhaps the end user devices themselves don't all belong in CIP because then we start talking about the lifespan of the equipment um, and then versus how long you're going to bond it out for. So if we're talking about equipment that we think is going to last for five years, we're trying to move that into the operating fund because that's something that will cyclically be refreshed. Um, so Kate and I have been working together as I put together the, the CIP and the equipment budget for the school side. We've been working together to figure out, okay, what is something like a switch, a server, carts, things that will probably have a much longer lifespan mm -hmm. of, you know, seven, eight, nine, ten years. We'll put those in CIP. And then end user devices, other peripherals like document cameras, you know, maybe some cabling, things like that, pointers, remotes that will go into the operating fund. So last year we moved $115,000 into that operating fund line. This year we added 135. So we're now up to 250. We really have like a 4 to 5 year plan to kind of get all of that appropriated into operating fund. Okay. So what it means is of that 400 and the overall tech refresh is about $440,000 project. Uh, 194 that would be funded through the capital project mm -hmm. uh, and bonded. The rest of it we'll see tomorrow in the school's operating budget. Right. <clears throat> so I, I guess along those lines too, because we're on uh, municipal and school are, are on two different, I don't want to say networks, but they're on Google, we're not yet. Um, will we see, will we realize any overall town savings if we were to convert over to Google and with switching and software and all that other stuff? That's one of our goals for 2016, 2017. Right. We're really doing a lot of research around is it um, more appropriate for us to go to Google or to Office 365. So Office 365 is kind of the Microsoft version, online mm -hmm. version. Um, either way on the town, town side, we'll have to pay for it because municipal versus 
Google has Google Apps for Education, right. so it's basically free for all educational entities, whereas on the municipal side, you do have to pay. It is discounted because you're a government entity, but you'll still have to pay for it. So our, our users on the municipal side are very different than our users on the school side in terms of their needs and kind of what they're comfortable with. So we are looking at potentially staying with Microsoft, but taking it to the cloud. Okay. And you're still at, um, even with all of these things coming through on your goals, I know you said to reserve the right, you're still comfortable right now with staffing levels? Yeah. Okay. Yeah. Okay. We, we're, <coughs> the cross training that we've done throughout the last couple of years has really helped. And we do have help on the school side as well, some sort of 100% school employees. So we have some um, ed techs and we have some tech integrators that we have cross-trained with. I think we have really good um, collaboration with them. We re meet regularly with them, and so we, they're sort of our boots on the ground in terms of being in each building all the time, so they can escalate issues as needed to us. Yeah. Okay. Good time. Other questions? Good. Just a, a, an anecdote, I had the occasion to meet uh, three of the potential candidates for the superintendent position, and to a person, they all made note and were envious of the um, IT setup we have. Really? And, and, uh, apparently it's not uh, all that common, so I just relate that as a mm. yeah, the model. Or or worth. <coughs> they were intrigued by the model, the shared The model, model and also the, the, yep. the amount of technology and the way we're using it. Mm. Uh, uh, they just, you know, we're in the schools for a short little bit, but uh, I was just taken back. They all made a point of uh, making that observation at one point or another. Oh, that's cool. I have to give a lot of credit to the high school. They have their far more advanced from where I thought they would be at mm -hmm. this point with one-to-one. -one. I don't know if you've had a chance to watch the video that we put yeah. together. It was, you know, it's just a short little anecdote about kind of what's going on. We do hope in future years to update that video so you can kind of see the progress that's being made. But um, I think there's a lot of excitement and momentum around that program. So. Yeah, that's great. Thanks. Thanks um, capital much. equipment? Yes. Yes. Okay. Uh, which is page three. Yeah, tab six yeah. or tab seven? Yeah, page three. Tab six, page three. Um, so again, not a whole lot in capital equipment. We are going to do a course switch upgrade. So this is really part of our ongoing, I, I like to call it, call it sort of phase 2B of our virtualization project. We took about 15 or 16 uh, physical servers and we um, condense them into three servers, mm -hmm. virtualized servers. So the benefit there is you kind of do away with a lot of the maintenance costs of 16 individual pieces mm -hmm. of equipment and consolidate it into three. Um, it provides quite a bit of redundancy and disaster recovery. The one problem that we have though is that there are um, cards within these servers that, or I'm sorry, the switch, cards within the switches that um, are, there's different layers within tech, and so they are transport as opposed to um, uh, de deployment. So essentially if you think your data is going along on a bus just fine, but the bus never stops. So <laughs> we need the bus to stop in certain places so we can give you your email, we can give you, you know, whatever data packets are coming through. Right now what's happening is we're dropping data packets. Um, so, you know, we have some connectivity issues. So we just need to upgrade those cards and that's what you see. The total cost for that project is 53360 That will be split evenly between the school and the town. Um, the, other, the other item in uh, capital equipment is for a vehicle replacement. Um, we had this in last year. We have managed to sort of limp through this year with our existing van, um, but we have been told by Public Works that the van, I think it's now 11 years old and has a lot of miles on it, and they're having trouble finding parts to even fix it, replace it. What we'd like to do is uh, get something that's much more efficient, cost efficient, um, and we need something with a little more storage because we do haul around a lot of equipment. So we've been looking at um, $20,000 range of Ford Transit, I think it's called a Transit Connector. 
So it's a little van. It's not a big 20 passenger van. It's sort of a little cargo Build van. Right, but you get you get 10 in the in the line item here. I yeah, was thinking so that was more like a on the other side. A gator or something like that. Oh, there's yeah. 10 oh, okay. on the municipal and 10 on the municipal. Okay. Yeah. 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 We're not giving you like a skidoo with a, with a, with a trailer no. or something, right? Where's yeah. Robbie? I've Figured. had that before. Get that ATV. That didn't work out well. That's right. The trailer behind the ATV. We had Jen use what she actually called the clown car one year. <laughs> I loved it. My staff did not. <laughs> it was a glorified golf cart, essentially, and uh, right. it really served the purpose. It was hard to find a place to plug in at that time. But yeah. <laughs> It was a little, um, you know, it was raining. It was a little wet. <laughs> Uncomfortable. So uh, that actually has expired. It didn't make it into the following year, so we had to do away with that. I, I have told Robbie that I might go and, and steal the Segway at some point. <laughs> um, so, yeah, we're looking at, at some kind of small cargo van, and that's it for our capital equipment. <coughs> Questions? No. Tom or no. Nope. 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 Thank you. Thank you very much. Thank you. Thank you. Appreciate it. Okay. And by the way, you you are the one that gets kudos, um, and um, you get to go to all the other department heads that spoke earlier and collect because you kept us right on track. <laughs> I'm going to collect a segue. <laughs> <laughs> thank you very much. I didn't thank take you. long. Thank you. Thank you very much. Um, with that. Um, I'm going to ask, if you don't mind, because of the time, if there's no objection, item number four, the discussion on the budget forum. Um, I'd like to, uh, this is about the forum forum, right? No, it's about the format. Uh, whether you oh, sorry, I was just reading that word. On the format. So, yes, whether you, you want to continue with this same sort of format of uh, bringing folks in front of you and having time? Okay. Yes. So, yeah. I, 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 I appreciate it, especially as a new counselor, getting the, the input from each one of the department heads helps me, for sure. Yeah. Fine. We're prepared to do, and, and actually at your places, we've provided a revised schedule based on some of these last minute changes. You'll notice there is a, an open session that we're kind of have scheduled. Um, I do hope you will allow staff to come back and have a full discussion about the staffing plan. Uh, where we have that is something that may end up at the end, yeah. uh, and that's fine, too. I think that's... Probably okay. the good, Great. good which we should have, I would assume we'll have most of the moving pieces in place by then? Or yes, the schedule drags yeah. you through uh, or drags all of my departments in front of you. Um, okay. So yeah, you'll have an extra yep. session to use as you wish. So if I can, um, so just a couple of things just for public uh, edification. Um, so we mentioned at the beginning uh, today's schedule did deviate a little bit from the originally posted. So we are having um, a town council finance committee meeting tomorrow in place of the joint finance committee meeting. We're not having the joint workshop committee meeting. Um, and we will start at 2 o'clock to 4 o'clock. And um, the only item that we'll be reviewing is the school department's budget. So um, we do appreciate um, both the public safety coming in today um, and changing their schedule and fire, police, and EMS, as well as I'm um, glad that we were able to accommodate the school's request to change the schedule. So. I'm looking forward to that. Just for uh, the public, the next um, item after that is on Wednesday, April 27th, which will be library, SEDCO, which is Discovery Economic Development, financing and assessing, and then this will, of course, be online for everyone to view for the other dates as well. I think, yeah. isn't that the 20th? Because we've got two 27s here. Oh, sorry, I didn't see. I've got these new glasses. I just can't, <laughs> and, they're, and, they're, and they're a trifocal, and so yeah. that should be the 20th. It should be the 20th, yes. Sorry about that. Yep. And I'll be prepared in the administration one uh, if we're able to accomplish those library SIDCO and finance um, with time left. We, I'll slide up just to fill your time. And I know yep. you want to stay here till 6 o'clock. <laughs> no, 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 no. And one last quick item under final review. If you could actually break that down to two pieces. One is final review and then the second. I would like to indicate that we're going to look at long range or long term planning requests slash staffing requests. Um, so that the public's aware of what that conversation Great. will be. Yep. Excellent. Um, so we covered the future meeting dates and times. Very quickly, what I would like to provide to you as well, and this is for information only, we can have a conversation, but it's been on the Council's Finance Committee's agenda. Um, one is just so that you know, we did receive the internal uh, financial statements. Um, we can bring that up at a later time. We obviously don't have time to, and again, these are internal, unaudited, um, informational purposes at this time, or we can talk about it later if there's a desire to do so. 
Um, what I did want to provide is that um, I think that based on what we are viewing in our budget, there needs to be a significant conversation around fund balance policy. And so um, what I would like to give um, you folks um, is really a copy. I, I, I think you know, um, and Tom, I've got a copy for you no matter what. Um, just a disclaimer and disclosure because, of course, this stuff can be shared with people. Um, the way I have always worked as chair is that I've always liked providing at least a baseline for the conversation. So I hope no one expects, um, I have no expectation that what I have recommended in here um, is going to be policy, but rather as a baseline for us to have that conversation and things can be edited, added, amended, deleted, um, completely, you know, um, the policy could be completely thrown out for um, if it's, that's your decision. So. The, the issue is that we need to have that conversation about, and by the way, it's about fund balance, and it's not only unrestricted, but we also need to, should have a conversation around the restricted, restricted balances as well. So, um, and I do have extra copies for um, the, the finance staff as well, um, so I'll make sure that you get them, but um, we should have that conversation. Oh, sorry. <coughs> Last but not least, We've had this constant conversation over the last couple of years. Uh, last year started it. This year we have made it a goal and a commitment to creating um, um, really a, a, uh, an executive macro look at fin the financial condition and direction of the community. Um, and there seems to be a lot of conversation about the educational side and what metrics are appropriate. And we've had that conversation at the um, joint finance, uh, the joint committees. Um, but we've never had the conversation about the community as a whole and the municipal services. So what I want to provide to the two of you are two resources that I found that I think are very helpful. <coughs> Tom, I have a copy for you, and I'll send it electronically. Um, and what this is called is the Guide to Indicators of Financial Con Conditions. It was, um, I forgot the title page. This was a resource I found from the uh, Kansas State University, and it talks about this is purely a financial perspective. There is no narrative about why, which ones, how, but really here are all the financial ratios that a community can use to determine or to assess where it's going. Um, and so I want you to kind of take a look at that and uh, we can have a conversation at some point because this will hopefully be the uh, impetus and, and baseline for us to talk about what we want to see in that dashboard um, and what the definitions are and how they can be interpreted. The last piece I want to provide, and Tom, I think I said I have one for you and I can give one to Ruth, I have one for you as well. Um, is that I want to provide you with an example of, of one. Again, um, some people might say, well, you know, the example is some place where we want to kind of strive for it. I will state unequivocally, I do not want to become like the state comptroller, uh, the uh, New York State Comptroller's Office. But my example is there is because I thought that their format and more so their explanation of how those ratios can be used uh, for a community. Um, and, and please extrapolate from this information that the definitions, while used at the state level, do correlate directly down to the community level. Mm -hmm. So um, I'm, I want to give you each one of those, and that, Tom, I'll have one for you as well. Again, this is a starting point for us to get this going because I would like to see us have at least a working document at the, at the end of this term so that next finance committee meeting, the budget will take a while, mm -hmm. um, can really put some substantive to this conversation so we have something in place the next budget cycle and next uh, fiscal year. So. Um, that is informational only, um, you know, for your point, and by means, if you go out there, there are plenty of resources out there that you can get. In fact, I ordered a book, um, a personal book, which I'll share with everyone, that is the basis of the uh, Kansas State piece. It's actually referenced, and I ordered the actual entire um, book from ICMA, which is the uh, International Society of County Managers Association or yeah, something. I never heard it called that. Well, it's ICMA. So, um, I thought it would, be, it would just help us along in that conversation. Great. Thank uh, you. With that, um, moving on, if there's anybody in the public that, or the audience that would like to speak before we close out today? Not seeing any. I do want to say thank you to everyone who came and everyone who's still here and all the staff and Town Councilor Donovan is here as well. Um, and Councilor Monroe. Oh, sorry. Well. He's sitting right in front of me. <laughs> <laughs> Scanned it and I didn't even see new glasses. You definitely need new glasses. <laughs> yeah. Um, but thank you, Councilor Rome, for coming as well. Um, and with that, move to adjourn. So move. Second. 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 All in favor? Great. Thank you, everybody.